What's going on, guys? Welcome back to The Control Room. I'm your host, Esrael Johannes, and I have a very special guest with me today. She is the Mavericks basketball graphics producer who is in charge of running all the graphics during the game, throughout the regular season, and the first round of the playoffs for Valley Sports Southwest. She's one of the people who trained me so that I could do the job that I have now, and literally without her, I would not be doing what I'm doing right now. And so all the thanks in the world to the, my very special guest, Michaela Lewis. How are you doing right now? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. It's good, to have, <laughs> it's good to have you on. Um, there's no one more in depth with as many Maverick stats than you, because I've been with all the studio guys running in rotation. And so there are games that I miss and we have to rely on you and Ryan Doyle and uh, CJ who does thunder to just kind of keep up with the teams as, as best as we can. So you are the most in depth um, of anyone in the truck. So let's start off at the beginning. How did you find your way into sports broadcasting as a, was it an interest of yours before going into college? Was it something that you kind of found in college? How did you find your way into this industry? Okay. So I definitely was, I used to watch sports with my dad growing up and I was a part of an orga organization in high school that um, helped put on the college fair. So like literally one of my jobs was to <laughs> bring in like the college representatives. And so um, TCU was there and then I helped bring in the representative and we chatted. And then my dad came with me to like walk through the college fair and he was like, oh, look at this school. They have like sports broadcasting. That would be fun. So I definitely thought I was going to be like the next Aaron Andrews when I first started. And then I learned very quickly that I don't want to do anything on camera, that I there are so many more jobs behind the scenes. And that was way more what I was drawn to. Um, so TCU literally has, a, like my degree is in sports broadcasting. So like we have a control room with um, the replay machines that we have in the truck and um, a similar graphic system. And when I was there, our stuff was airing on what was then Fox Sports Southwest. So like I was literally putting on the TCU women's basketball games, baseball games, soccer, volleyball on typically the plus channel, but on Fox sports Southwest. And then I ended up working there, which is wild. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So the, uh, when I, when I first had Dave on, um, he, he had told me about how the film school didn't really evolve with the sports broadcasting side. And so there's like a, there's an imbalance between how Baylor and TCU as you know, these two colleges are rivals, how those programs have shifted in terms of you know, moving forward with the technology and all that. Um, so with the skill sets you have now, what did, what skill sets that you use today? Did you, did you learn in college where that were the foundation that was set in college uh, that you really still lean on today? Yeah. Okay. So I don't, I don't really run replay anymore, but I had like a serious basic knowledge of an EVS because we had an EVS Nano, which is like one of like the simplest forms of an EVS when I was at school. So as far as like when I first, like, so I interned for the Mavs with Dave Keeney, who's my producer and when I was in college. And so part of that internship was like, here, learn all the roles in the truck, blah, 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 blah. So um, when I first sat down in EVS, like I already knew the basics of how to work the machine because it was basically just a more advanced version of the machine I already had at school. Um, and then just like even the, just because we weren't on the same graphics machine, um, we still... So like the base, same basic process, like the way that the program set up at TCU is like, not only I would say that for the most part, the tech physical technology we have, like the cameras, the replay machines, the switcher and all of that is basically a, it's not like the same level as what you would get on a truck, but it's like the basic level of what you could get on a truck. So gives you a really basic knowledge of all that stuff. But then just even the way they have um, your classes set up 
as far as like you take intro to remote, remote sports. So you're physically operating the cameras and then you take remote sports and that's when you're um, like a TD, a replay RO, a graphics operator, the bug, the bug guy, and then you can take directing and producing. So you actually direct and produce. So we have our control room set up essentially the same way that you would in a truck. Like it's all, we have all the positions. Nobody's ever like double duting. Like you don't ever have someone who's a graphics person and there's no associate producer to like help them with that. And there's always a lead EVS person. So it's never just like all students. Usually there's like a pro in there. That's the lead EVS person so that you know, you have one person that's taking on the majority of the responsibility. So it's set up in a very similar manner as if it would be if you were like out in the quote unquote real world. You mentioned Dave Keeney, the um, the Mavericks basketball producer. Um, I assume because because of how you both connected initially, he's one of the mentors that you had early in the industry. Um, along with him, how uh, who are your other mentors that you leaned on earlier in your career that you're still connected to, to this day? Um, so other people, (laughs) honestly, I would not be where I would be like where I am now if I hadn't done the Mavs internship. And I have that internship because Dave also went to TCU, but most of the people that I met in the truck when I was an intern, specifically people like Dave and then, um, Diz who is now, a director for the Rangers used to have my job. And so he's helped me just like really, uh, I guess not, not panic's not the right word, but just like help me bounce stuff off of him. Like when there's a lot of stuff going on between work and life and whatever else. And then, um, Harrison Montgomery, who actually does not work in sports anymore. (laughs) I, he's the one who, uh, taught me how to use the viz. And then Eric Stoner also really helped just like get my, you know, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but helped me along in in the sense of like teaching me not only the viz, but like what to look for, for statistics and, you know, how to manage like a control room and how to manage like telling an operator what you want and just all that kind of nitty gritty stuff that you don't necessarily think about um from like when you're just like working your way up when it comes to researching stats i mean when i when i first came in at that point you guys had already been using sport radar for several years what was the first database that you were using if it wasn't sport radar and if it was what was it like using radar in the earlier years of its iterations Um, Okay, so the year that I became an AP was the year that they started using sports radar. So for the most part, that's the only thing um, I've used. And then I also have a, um, they used to use Stats Inc. That's not the, what I have anymore. What do I have? I have the, um, what's, what's like the stats thing through basketball reference that you have to pay for? Oh, stat head? Yes, I have StatHead, which I really like. Um, between StatHead and Radar360, uh, you can basically find everything you need to know. Uh, the biggest issues with Radar at the beginning was just that they, for the most part, on like anything historical, couldn't go past 1996, which is like a big issue when um, the NBA started significantly before 1996. So, um, and then just like learning the different quirks of Radar there were still a lot of bugs when we first started using it because it was still a relatively new system. So just like sometimes you'd have to have the live button on and then sometimes you wouldn't have to have the live button on or like just, just random things that like you would think would work, but wouldn't work. But honestly they've improved a lot and they're very handy now. And like, once you figure out the, the ways to like manipulate the system, you can kind of um, discover some pretty interesting things on there. Yeah. Uh, what, speaking of which, um, you said your first year as an AP, first year that Radar came out. What year was that, and which team were you covering at that time? I I was doing the Spurs, because we were still doing Spurs pre-post at that point. Um, 
I guess that must have been 2019, maybe 28, oh, maybe 2018. I don't remember. I think it may be 2018. I did a whole season where we were just doing the road games. Like we would only do Spurs pre post for road games. And then uh, maybe it was 2019. Then COVID happened. And then we did all the games. So it must have been 20, 2019. That sounds right. Somewhere in that range. <laughs> what were some of the things that you had, uh, that you had, researched and looked for that you found were probably the most interesting, especially for a Spurs team where at the time they had just gotten DeMar DeRozan. So it, they were still somewhat competitive. Um, I'm sure there were, you know, some exciting things to kind of look for rather than the downturn they had in years, years following. Um, so yeah, what were, what were some of the things that you were looking up initially that you were like, Oh, I didn't know I could find this. And then it just kind of, helped you okay. grow as an AP? So I don't think that you were really, I don't think you were around when we had Joseph Perales as a producer. Um, he is much more of a creative than he is um, someone that is stats oriented. So honestly, a lot of my job was like doing things on Photoshop and trying to figure out things on After Effects because our show was very much not cookie cutter. Like I think that um pre and post game shows a lot of the time you just like get into the rhythm of what they are because they're a pre and post game show there's only so much creative energy you can put into them um not joseph joseph puts all the creative energy into them so a lot of the time my job was not necessarily like going deep into stats it was more uh let's make this as creative as possible like my first year we did a show on Valentine's Day, and I had to put together a bunch of fake um, Valentine's Day cards from the different uh, Spurs players. Like, we had nothing to do with stats, but it was a great segment. And then, um, honestly, the out like stuff that was stat oriented, a lot of it came from our analyst, Dan Wise, who's still on their broadcast. Um, he is a big stats nerd, and um, we used to do like a segment with him. And honestly, the biggest part of that job was just trying to figure out how to get all the information he wanted onto a graphic in a way that made sense. <laughs> and how for the audience to also understand what I was putting on the graphic, because half the time he'd send me these things. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. I've never heard of this stat in my life. So, <laughs> um, which is honestly probably helpful because I was able to try to decipher it for the audience before it was fed to the audience. Now that I think about the crew on that show, did you also have Joe Abalmos uh, on EVS? Yes. So you guys were a, a two-team tandem for a while, even mm -hmm. after the Spurs had moved to San, uh, moved on site to San Antonio, and mm -hmm. we weren't running them anymore. Um, how was how was it having the same person next to you over multiple years? Um, because I was able to have him for one season. And then when he went to Memphis to do the Grizzlies game broadcasts, uh, we'd, we'd had Ryan Little and Zach Geld in rotation. And so I haven't been able to have one EVS person next to me for a whole season since Joa, and I wasn't doing this before Joa. Uh, so what's it like having, having the same person that you can kind of kick off ideas with um, year after year after year? Um, honestly, the best part about working with Joa was working, he was working with his dad because Joseph was his dad. So he could like speak Joseph. So then he could uh, decipher Joseph to me. And then we w moved to Mavs and I could speak Clark. So then I could decipher Clark for Joa. Um, <laughs> so it was really more about like, we had great communication. And then it was more about how uh, I could communicate for him or how he could communicate for me because the communication wasn't necessarily going in a three-way street all the time. <laughs> now that you guys were, we're transitioning to the Mavs now because we're hitting the, I think this was the 21, 22 season. Was that, was that the first season you did Mavs or was it? Oh the yeah. I think that sounds right. I don't okay. even know if I did a full season of Mavs before, um, before the person who had my job before me left. So I think that yeah. sounds right. Um, uh, Okay, so let's go into 21 22 because I, I didn't come into the building until January, February of that season. Um, and what was it like moving to 
another team? What because you you had gotten used to the Spurs a little bit, and now you're making this transition to a team. Although they're in the same division, they're in the same building. Um, it's still a completely different team. Uh, what was that transition like for you when you first started doing Mavs? And I guess how often were you able to uh, keep up with the Mavericks before uh, you started doing that role? Um, well, one, the transition got a lot was a lot easier because Joa stayed with me, so I still had um, my right hand man next to me, which was great. And then um, just I had kind of paid attention to the Mavs, anyways, because the uh because since my internship like i'm from california and i i've always been a kings fan um but you know the kings have been really bad up until like two seasons ago so um it was nice not that the maps are really that much better at that point in time but at least they had luca um so i had kind of like paid attention to them but not anything like deep dive or anything just like briefly you know paid attention um but eric Stoner, who's also my boyfriend, was doing Mavs. So I was paying attention just through him and asking him like what was going on at work and that kind of thing. So let's go into that that moment where I where I had come in, because I think that that's when this transition happened, where the person before you in the truck, um, Katya Vialba, was running the game broadcast. And then um, she had moved to another job. And so we needed someone to fill in and that left people kind of filling in for you on Mavs live. And so one, what was that transition like trying to one, trying to figure out how to do game broadcast, which I mean, you you've already had experience with, with TCU. Um, but also having to kind of like cover both bases. Like you were going back and forth. Cause even in the playoffs, you were doing Mavs live after the first round. So there was a, there was a lot on your plate. Go, happening all at once uh you're essentially working to get a promotion but also like trying to fulfill your responsibilities so what, what was that uh time period like for you yeah honestly um freaking crazy <laughs> like just like it was nuts i mean, like really feel like i've blacked out half that time just because i just was going 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 all the time and i did so cat last game was like right before all-star break and um i think there was like two games before all-star break that she didn't do and i think i don't remember who did them but uh i didn't do them and then we got back from all-star break and my very first two games were um on the road (laughs) which i had never done before and um in utah and san francisco which are notoriously like two of the hardest places to get on the air in the NBA. Just like the trucks aren't the, the best. And um, just, it's just, they're just, you're not on a um, like racked viz, you're on like a portable viz. And those always come with like weird, you know, you just never know what's going on with them. They're a little beat up. So, um, uh, oh, and the game in San Francisco, the Mavs came back down like 24 in the fourth quarter. And I'm like, this is great. <laughs> Everything's fine. I'm, I want to cry, but it's fine. <laughs> Honestly, I would have not gotten through that game. Kat and I are friends. So Kat was sending me screenshots of stuff from Radar being like, hey, go look this up. Like you're going to need this. So honestly, shout out to her because Homegirl really helped it, helped me out because the game in San Francisco was so stressful, just not only like the game, but like the lead up to the game, we were having technical issues across the board, like issues with the EVS issues with the Viz. I think all of us got like a 20 minute lunch. Like it was nuts. So, um, just like even those first two games, I was like, I, I hate this. I don't want to do this. I have so much, this is giving me so much anxiety. Like, I don't know if this is worth it. And then I got to do some home games and it got a lot better. (laughs) Um, what was it, what was it like being able to work with Dave again after a couple of years away from him? Uh, cause like you've, you've had that time with him at the Mavericks. Um, but then, you know, after working with Joseph and then with Clark, uh, it, it can, sometimes it's, it's like right off the bat, you just know what each, what each person wants. Sometimes it takes a little getting used to again. Uh, what was that transition like once you were fully in the truck working with someone you were familiar with? I think I was at like a big advantage because I did spend a whole season in the match truck. So like 
I know how Dave likes to operate. I know how Clay operates. Um, for the most part, for Mavs, we have the same graphics operator, uh, EJ, who's been there for years. And so not only like is he a resource because he's always there, but also like this is someone who's known me since I was 20. So, you know, I have a good relationship with him. Um, but I did like – for the most part, their attitudes really hadn't changed in the five years I hadn't been there, however long it had been since I was an intern. So I had a really good understanding of like how the workflow goes, which was really nice. And um, honestly, something that I like pride myself in is that I, I'm really good at like, I guess just like understanding what people want, for lack of a better word. Like I'm, I'm, Honestly, the biggest part of being an AP is like reading people's minds, specifically your producer. And it's honestly why Clark likes working with me is because I can read his mind. It's why Dave likes working with me is because I can read his mind. Like I just typically good at figuring out like how people operate because usually there's some sort of like routine in how they like things to get done. And I just you show me the routine, I'm going to thrive. Like, I got you. I'm I'm just here. It's your show, and I'm just here to make it look better. <laughs> I get to see all the, all the questions that you send in Slack, which has, the, there's a whole Sport Radar team attached to that workspace, and they can get us queries that we're not able to get on the site. Um, so the, there, there are so many questions that you ask when you prepare for every single game. And I wonder... How much of that comes from, one, your curiosity to just uh, something that you want to update over time and versus it coming from Dave and saying, like, he says, I want this, and you saying, I want this? How do you, how do you kind of put together all the graphics that you may or may not use throughout a game broadcast? Okay, so um, I also, Mark Followell, who's our play-by-play person, a uh, big stats guy. <laughs> so, and uh, Dave used to ha- previously had the job that I'm in now. So also big stats guy. So we're in a Google doc and everyone puts in like their graphical, you know, ideas or stats ideas into the Google doc. Um, if you want to go in- need to go into my process of how I do that, it's kind of wild. Um, there's a lot of, I, after a game and I'm getting ready to prepare, prepare for the next one. I quite literally pull up courtside and I stare at the box score <laughs> and it's, I just sit there and stare at it just to see if anything like in my brain starts connecting of like, well, Lucas had 30 points in the last X, Y, Z games, or like he's been shooting the three ball well or whatever. And I just sit there and I stare at it and wait for my brain to make connections. Um, and then, uh, or if there's like something that was in the Google Doc from like a couple games that didn't, a couple games ago that didn't get in, I will like scroll back in the Google Doc and just see if there's stuff that I can like either update or and or take the information and like alter it to fit the story that we're trying to tell for whatever opponent we're playing next. What are some of the concepts that you guys had run through? throughout the season, especially as you saw success from the Mavs in a specific category. One, one that comes to mind for this season specifically was the coaches challenge and Literally how often, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know what, maybe I should just let you answer. You, you have it right there. So, um, um, okay. So like coaches challenges aren't anything that radar keeps track of like physically through the, um, like through something. It's not something I can go look up basically. So it got to the point where, I mean, for the most part, there's a challenge every game. So it was one of those things where it's like, okay, we need to ask before every home game because the Mavs are in like the top five. So as long as they continuously be successful, like this is very relevant um, because something we honestly probably should have done is compare from last year to this year because last year, the uh, coaches challenge is not a strong suit for Jason Kidd this year. Don't know what changed. Couldn't tell you. I don't know if there's just like the assistant coaches have a better idea of like, Oh yeah, they're going to overturn this or what the situation was, but this year way more successful. And so it was just one of those things when you're in the top five and something like that, then that you can't just go look up on your own. It's one of those things that like, we got to ask for this every game because 
I don't have a way of finding out this information on my own. Like this is something that I need people to collect the information for me. Last season when it was your first year in the truck. So this was 22, 23 where, um, there were, if I had a nickel for every time I had heard you on headset, say, get the rebound, stop shooting threes, make your free throws. I'd probably have a million dollars. Um, so what about those three things that you, that we both saw in the Mavs that were consistently bad, um, that, I guess improved this year that you were like, you know what there I'm noticing the trend. I'm noticing the shift here. Uh, let's kind of, you know, highlight those things. What did you make of that improvement for the maps in those three categories? Um, we definitely t- post trade this year. We definitely talked about offensive rebounds a lot. Um, just because it improved a lot from even like the first half of the season to the trade, just because, we traded for two people who can rebound. So handy. Um, free throws. Still questionable sometimes, but you know, improvement. We have, Kyrie's a great free throw shooter. Seems to have rubbed off a little bit on people. Um, and then just like we also talked about this year, uh, the Mavs made a big emphasis on pace of play as well. And so we talked about several times throughout the year, just uh, their increased pace of play. So like the stat of pace in general, but also like fast break points or um, what you refer to as like outlet passes. So um, talking about Luca's passes of like 50 plus feet or whatever it was. And um, just that kind of stuff of like, Hey, (laughs) We were really bad at this stuff last year, but look at us now. We've improved so much. So go us. And typically for the most part, like the the stats will tell that story as of like, Hey, look, we were bad, but Jason Kidd made sure we emphasized on this and look, now we've improved. So look at us go. When the, when the Mavs got into the playoffs and then went into the first round, you, you had had the playoff experience two years before, but this was in that transition period for you. This time around, you had already done a full season, two seasons in a row. What was it like doing playoff broadcasts where the stakes are much higher on the court? And when, when I work a, a playoff game, I tend to feel like the stakes are a little bit higher in the, in the control room as well. Uh, so what is it like for you in the truck when you get to do those high stakes games? Do you want to hear something wild? The first time that I did playoffs, like the first year that I hadn't even done the AP position for the full season, that was the first time I ever done a broadcast or a playoff game in ever. Like the Spurs didn't go to the playoffs when I worked for them. So I had never done a playoff game in general. And I'm like, okay, here I am just uh, APing the game now. It's fine. I'm fine. I'm not stressed. It's okay. Um, But this year, because I had already done this for two seasons, to me, like, I really try to approach it in the same way that I would approach any game, just because I think that there is enough people around me that are uh, emphasizing that this is not a normal game and that this is the playoffs and that this is a big deal and that our broadcast should be great. But like our broadcast should be great every night, like regardless of if it's playoffs or not. Do we might get some like extra things like fancy cameras and that kind of stuff? Yeah, definitely. But like, I still have to get my sponsors in. We still have to go to and from break. Like my job responsibilities are still the same. So I try not to stress myself out too much. Like I try to have all like my playoff graphics ready and like have the things, you know, as far as historical type of thing in the back of my mind. But I don't usually try to like amp it up too much just because I feel like if you get yourself too anxious about something, that's when the mistakes are going to happen. So I really try to like keep my approach the same. I'm like a player, you know, they, they say it's, it's, it's just another game. We're just approaching it the same way. That's my same mentality. Yeah. I feel like that that's helped me out a bit when I, when I take an athletic approach or an, or an, an athlete's approach to, to broadcasting, it tends to help me out a lot, a lot more than if I were to be like, 
this is TV. This is completely different. It's, it's never, yeah. it's not always like that. I want to go to a specific game that was, well, actually two of them. One of them was record breaking in terms of the totality of the performance. The other one in scoring the first one, December 27th, 2022 at home versus the Knicks. This was a game where the crew was sent to site. So I couldn't even help you on pregame and postgame. So you had to do the whole really thing. Nice to to <laughs> it would have been really nice to have you there. It would have been really nice to have you there. So what was, Luca went for 60, 21, and 10 in a game that went to overtime after the Mavs were down nine with like a minute to go. Um, f- first, what? how does that happen? Two, what's it like on the graphics side when you're preparing for a specific result and then that result doesn't happen in the span of a minute? And then when all of these records are broken all at once, how do you adjust so quickly, especially when you have to do it all yourself? Okay. Fortunately, um, Dave and Clark were both like sending me links to things that they needed because I was just like, I literally put my head in my hands at one point because I was just like, I have to do post game after this (laughs) also. So I have two different people asking me for stuff and um, I just need this man to stop. Like, I just, can you just find your chill for like 30 seconds, please? Because I just had to like stop and be like, I'm okay. It's going to be fine. Okay. Focus. What do you have to get done? (laughs) I was very thankful that um, I was getting sent links to me so that I didn't have to like go look up the information. The information was being sent to me. So fortunately, even though it would have been great to not have to do post game after that show, Um, It was very helpful that Clark was there because he was able to take some of like the research burden off of me so that I could just focus on getting the graphics built rather than researching the information and then communicating that to EJ of like, okay, I need this shell, pull up this, okay, type this here, blah, 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 blah. Like it just took away one step so so that I could get stuff done faster. Um, But also at that point, like, it's one of those things when he does stuff like that, where you have to like let the moment breathe as well, instead of like trying to like force graphics down everyone's throat. So um, I don't even know how many graphics we ended up getting in during that span. I think a lot of my stuff ended up in post game just because that was the chance to like really be able to talk about it because yeah, he has 60, 20 and or 21 and 10, which I think it only happened one other time. I think James oh, Harden never, done it. it. It never happened. He, oh, his 60-point tri- sixty point triple-double was just him and James Harden. And then, um, but just like a, lo- a lot of my graphics, I think I'll push to post-game just because then we tied the game and had to go to overtime. So like, not only did he just do something historical, which is crazy, but like, there's still a game going on. Like, we still have a game to go win. So... We still have to focus on like, okay, what do the Mavs have to do to like close out the game now? Because we didn't think they were going to tie it up in the first place. Like there was just, it was just, it was just wild. It was pandemonium. Like, I don't even know because that, that game, crazy. Like I, I, that was like the first time that he'd really done like something like super historical while I was APing. And so I wouldn't say like, overwhelmed was the word I would use but just like honestly it I didn't even like recognize it was happening until like it happened and I was like oh, crap. like I gotta do stuff for this <laughs> and then but if you want me to take it around to the to the next historical thing I can go you can transition me there and I'll I got more oh, yeah. I got much better stories on on that one. Oh, on the on the other one yes um so the this was if I have the date correct, well, actually, I'm not going to guess it. It was a, a late game in January yeah. um, in Atlanta, State Farm Arena. The, the, the team that actually drafted Luca and then traded him over to North Texas. He dropped 73 on those Hawks heads because they decided we're just not going to double him until the fourth quarter. Um, and as I was, wa- I was watching this game at home because I wasn't crewed for it in the studio. I, I think it was Eric Stoner who was doing the um, pregame and postgame back in in Irving but watching Luca have five I think he had something like 40 in the first half I was like um I was in the middle of shaving uh shaving my beard and I was like you know what I'm just gonna stop 
doing that and like pay attention to this game because he might he might do what Joel Embiid just did a couple days. Just ago. did, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so there were there were so many moments of like, okay, he's breaking uh, his own record, and then he's breaking Joel's record, and then he's breaking NBA records, and it's just like in the game was still very tight. So it wasn't like a blowout where you could focus on, on Luca the whole time. It was like, there were so many things at play all at once. There was still a win at stake on this road trip. So how did you navigate that game with all that was going on? Oh, we only focused on Luca. We did not care about, <laughs> I mean, we wanted to win, but like we did not care about, about anything else that was going on. I think at one point we just, I think when he got to, 65 maybe we just left his numbers on the valley bar for like literally the rest of the game because it didn't matter i mean obviously from like a team perspective and like wanting the team to do well you want the team to win but like from a broadcast perspective we we only care about what's going on with luca that one i felt way more prepared for just because i had already done the 60 point triple double and then it just i I had enough experience under my belt that like the game is was slower and I could like recognize what's going on because when you first start doing this job, you have no idea how fast basketball is because you're just like, you're building a graphic and you look up and you're like, wow, it's not relevant anymore. This one I was like, <laughs> okay, I got this. So I have a whole section of my show that's literally just um, all the records that Luca breaks. So um like as far as I think he had most points and a half in, in Mavs history, probably. I don't remember, but I had, I have a whole section of like those graphics already built out and I just had to update them. Um, so anything like Mavericks historic was super easy for me to get done. Uh, the, all the NBA type things he was breaking. Um, I was able, the NBA stats literally has a section of, on their website of like most points in a game this season. And three of those happened within like a week of each other. So that was super easy. And then um, I got really good at using stat head this year. So the historical stuff, like that's typically where I go is uh, stat head for historical information, just cause it usually can go farther back than radar. And that was really easy to look up. So I just like kept continuously building like every time it was like okay most points in a half and then it was most points in a game this season and then it was most points in a game since 1996 and then it was just most points in a game <laughs> NBA history and I I I like literally just built graphic after graphic after graphic after graphic because he just kept breaking the record but like it, that one was honestly easier because he's just scoring like I'm not really having to keep track like triple the triple double stuff is just a little bit harder to like keep tr track of just because you know there's it's just that you can see someone physically score you're not always your brain's not always like recognizing oh he just got an assist oh he just got a rebound so uh, the scoring thing was like way way easier i was physically shaking at the end of the game my adrenaline was rushing so much but <laughs> It was uh, a lot. I found that one to be a lot easier than than the triple double one, and I just think it's because you can is is a visual thing of just like recognizing that. Holy crap! This guy's scoring a lot of points. <laughs> the triple double thing you brought up, um, it it just I just remembered that he had an NBA record six. I think it was six straight games with a thirty point triple double, and then seven straight twenty point triple doubles. And so, you know, as that streak is happening when it comes from game to game, I mean, I, I can tell you're prepared for when it happens. It's just a matter of like, of it actually happening. But as that streak was getting to its end, um, how much easier did it get? Like if it did get easier to just kind of keep up with, okay, it, this is, this is the next thing he's breaking. When, when streaks like that happen, I feel like that's way easier to keep track of because that's what you're looking for. Like you're waiting for him to get a 30 point triple double and the graphics are built it just needs to be sent out there because that information was already gathered at the end that they're like at the beginning of the day, I build the graphic and then wait for it to happen. And either, either does it, it makes error. Or he doesn't do it and it doesn't make error. But like, that's way like the streaks streaks are so easy and or easier just because you're just waiting for someone to like, to do it. It's kind of similar to like Daniel Gafford and his, his consecutive field goal thing. Like 
all I had to do is sit there and just keep updating every single time that he made a field goal. And I'm like, great, update it, update it. And it's what it's just like, it's already built. I'm just having to keep track of when he misses. So, and he didn't miss on a game that we had to do broadcast for. So I didn't have to do anything for that. <laughs> um, now, now that I think about it, what were your, what were your favorite graphics that never made air? Quite frankly, anytime I do, like, uh, if I went and, like, got on Getty and cut out all these random people that, you know, people have never never even heard of, I'm like, this graphic needs to get in. And then it doesn't. And that's really disappointing. Any graphic that I've, like, put a lot of extra effort into, like, making it pretty, but and it doesn't make air, I'm like, this is the worst. <laughs> and then becomes irrelevant in, like, the next game. It's like, I yeah. can't put it up anymore. I no. feel that. <laughs> Uh, but let's let's talk a little Mavs uh, because this this entire show is predicated on this idea that those of us behind the scenes who research all this stuff over time can also have an opinion on the game that's happening in front of us, um, while also breaking down you know how we get things on on the air, um, and you have a unique perspective being as close as you are to the Mavericks, and with them going on this playoff run. What were you expecting of the Mavs like as soon as they as we knew they were going to hit or eventually going to hit 50 wins and you know be in within the top 6 of the playoffs what was your expectation as they went from round to round eventually to the NBA finals Um well I mean I didn't really expect them to get to the NBA finals but <laughs> I I as soon as they beat the Thunder and then we were playing Minnesota I felt a lot better I was like oh. which apparently I had every right to feel that way since we went four and one in that series but um i figured they were going to beat the clippers just because i just didn't think i just didn't think that luca was going to lose to the clippers again i just don't think that that was going to he just physically was not going to allow that to happen um i thought the thunder was going to be a really good matchup which it ended up being and then i thought we would when we got through them i thought we would beat the timberwolves if we had to play the nuggets i don't know if that would have been the same case but no one wants to play the uh reigning champions so yeah i'm with you there on that one let's go to the nba finals as they're playing the boston celtics who have been a juggernaut all year long they've been the title favorites in my eyes all season long game one um it was close for about six minutes and then it just wasn't chris Porzingis came in i think i actually have this written down as to what his effect was in the game um, he entered the game with like seven minutes and 17 seconds remaining in the first quarter. Dallas went up by one and then Boston answered with a 25 to seven run. Um, and the last nine points of the first quarter was scored in 50 seconds on three straight possessions where KP had a screen assist, or at least it looked like a screen assist, a three, and then a block. And they all finished with a three point field goal made. Um, that led to a 17 point lead at the end of the first quarter, which was the largest first quarter lead in game one in NBA finals history. Um, and then, you know, Porzingis 11 points, four five shooting three rebounds, two blocks was the official box score with 18 points coming in the first half. Um, he finished over 60% from the floor. So like the effect of Porzingis we've seen, we've seen him with the Mavs because he played alongside Luca, but this Porzingis, was something that we had kind of hoped to see consistently in Dallas. And now he, I mean, he had to play in Washington for a year. And so he was able to grow there, but what was the effect of Porzingis in your mind for Boston all year long? And how has he kind of changed the series for them this time around since they haven't had him since Miami? Honestly, I mean, this is what Porzingis does. Like he gets injured, he sits out, he comes back, he plays a couple of good games. And usually he gets injured again, which he is. He's listed day to day now. So I'm not, I mean, they've, the Celtics are nine and one in postseason without him. They were 21 and four in the regular season without him. And I'm not saying like he doesn't, didn't make a difference. He obviously did, but like this team has proven that they can win without him. Like, not that he's not like a key component, but like they don't, I mean, they don't need him clearly. So like he played outstanding. Was he probably a big factor in the fact that it was such a large lead? Definitely. But like, I don't, 
I don't necessarily think that the Celtics don't win even if he didn't play. Yeah, they are they are quite an overpowered bunch with um, probably like really hitting high on the salary cap, and so it's not really a team designed to last for very long. They're trying to win a title now. Um, with even if KP were not able to play game three, or if he were not to play games three and four, um, and Boston is they're I think twenty seven and fourteen on the road in the regular season. Um, how do you see? Well. First, let's talk about game two, because I would think we we had paid more attention to game two, especially because it was closer. Um, what was it like seeing the Mavs kind of respond the way that they did in game two, although it didn't come out with a win? They at least kept it tighter. Uh, what kind of improvements did you see on the Mavericks side that they could potentially, you know, try to utilize in a potential win at home in games three and four? I mean, definitely playing better defense, like closing out. Um, I still think they allowed way too many second chance opportunities would really like them to rebound better. Obviously it's my grab the rebound, my favorite (laughs) phrase. (laughs) Um, so, but yeah, I stronger defensively Derek Lively didn't look nearly as lost out there. He felt looked like he looked a lot more comfortable, um, which I think is a huge key to the map success is how comfortable Derek Lively was looking. I mean, I can't imagine being him being a rookie in the finals, having lost his mom, like literally a month ago. Like I don't blame him at all for not looking his best in, in game one and like potentially being overwhelmed by the moment. I I a hundred percent get it. So him looking more comfortable though, is a big positive for the maps moving forward. What's the effect of Kyrie Irving? We talked about this before we came, before we came on and started the episode. Um, Kyrie is that that one B at least you looked at universally as that person that can bring the Mavs up to another level when Luca is playing the way that he has the last couple games. Uh, what have you noticed from Kyrie in terms of playing in Boston versus you know playing against Boston versus just how he is in the first and second halves and then how he is at home? Notoriously does not play well in Boston, not since he's left. So not surprising that he didn't play well. Um, hasn't played, I mean, it hasn't played bad on the road during the playoffs this year, but hasn't played, he's played very, very well at home. Like he is scoring four more points at home, is shooting the ball better at home. Just, I, he, this is weird to say, but like almost in a, typically like your role players play better at home. Like you're, your overall shooting percentage better is that better at home during the playoffs. Like your role players just play better there. So I'm not saying that he's playing a role player, but his numbers are falling along with like him being a role player because once again, not playing bad on the road, but just not playing the way we would like him to play. Like I need you to be going for like 25 every night, regardless if you're on home or road. Um, so we talked about offensive rebounding. Um, the free throw shooting actually was uh in game two they they had missed eight free throws and lost by seven uh which you know when you look at it in hindsight it's like oh make all your free throws and win the game but um given that it wasn't it wasn't just Luca who'd missed a free throw I think Daniel Gafford was at the line a few times and you know we can't expect centers to make every free throw um but Make your free throws. They're called free throws for a reason. Make your free throws. You're in the finals. Make your free throws. <laughs> That's all you have to do. That's four nickels. Um, I have 20 more cents. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, definitely free throw shooting is going to help the Mavs win more games than not. Um, it's not. It's not possible for Boston to have nights, like at least especially consecutive nights, where they – have a poor shooting night from three, but do you feel like that the Mavs could replicate that success um, or at least tone it down for Boston so that they don't explode like they did in game one? Is that more of the Mavs defense or was it Boston kind of missing shots? Cause there were some open ones that they could have knocked down, but didn't. It's a, I mean, it's a big mixture of both. I do. I think that, I I mean, you're the, I, I think honestly, the Mavs will probably have like a great shooting night from three, either in game three or game four. It's just like they're, they're due just like how Boston had a great one for game one. I think the likelihood of you replicating basically not missing 
essentially what it felt like is like they're making everything to then like making nothing. I just, it's, I think they're both teams are going to end up somewhere in between because both teams like to shoot threes. So it's all going to, they're all going to average out to probably about 36, 37% when the series is all said, it, said and done. I don't think the Mavs shoot the three nearly as bad in game one and game two as they will at home. I don't think that the Celtics are going to shoot as well as they did in game one. And I don't think they'll shoot as bad as they did in game two from three. I just, it's, it's, I think inevitably this is basketball. It's all going to, they're going to hit a happy medium at some point. Um, For the Mavs to win this series, they have to do what? Uh, First of all, can't let uh, Drew Holiday score however he wants. Because he had like 18 in the first half or something like that. It was crazy. It was th- his second highest scoring game of the whole season on for game two. The problem with Boston is they all can freaking make, like they can all make shots and they all play defense. They're a very complete team. And you, in order for the Mavs to win, you need your role players to start scoring. Like you can't rely on Luca and Kyrie. And right now you're not even really been able to like rely that much on Kyrie. So there has to be like PJ Washington needs to start hitting his threes. They're just Daniel Gafford and, and Derek Lively. They've got to figure out a way to get them to the basket to score because, and if they are going to get fouled, then those two got to practice their free throws because a lot of the Mavs success in the back half of the season has been, the ability to do the alley oops and the ability to get to the basket and relying less on the three. So let's say, you know, Boston decides they're going to double Luca more. Okay, great. Well, then that means that you need to be able to make your threes or you either need to take advantage of the fact that there's an open lane to the basket and get to the basket. Like those are your two options. So you got to keep, I think the defense they played in game two, if they can continue to replicate that, that's a good track for them. But they need to get their offense to be someone other than just Luca, because for the most part, it's been just Luca, and the man is like barely walking. So, like, not healthy at all. So, I just you you can't. You're going up a team that basically anyone can score versus right now you have one person that can score and. Five on one is not going to win you a championship. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, I haven't seen Boston blitz Luca as much as uh, OKC did, and yeah. Minnesota would, and, and the Clippers did. But uh, especially because, like you said, they're a complete team. They don't need to blitz, um, and Luca can pick you apart every time. Um, but you know, like that—that that is the. That's still by design, their way of saying, okay, like they, they want to take away the corner three. They've been one of the best defenses at taking away the corner three. And that's where the Mavs really like to operate as they shoot, I think above 40% from, um, I think the left corner. Um, but the way that, the way that they can kind of like slice through, especially those alley-oops, like they're, they're just not there. Like you said, um, that of course, like I'm in full agreement, agreement with you in terms of like somehow, it mathematically doesn't make sense that relying less on the three can give you more offensive success. Um, it, it's been hard for me to be, to be able to prove that mathematically, but there have been times where um, I could find some kind of a sequence, some kind of a cherry picked situation where, you know, you hold Boston to this amount at this rate and then you just score, you could win the game by two. Um, so I guess I do have that. Do have that number sitting around somewhere? Let me just. Uh, I mean, just so like to just like go along with your point mm-hmm. of so I mean the Pacers were never able to close out a game, but the way their ability to score was because they would push the pace and they were because they were pushing the pace they were driving at the basket. I mean they essentially tried to beat Boston by just outscoring them and not necessarily playing defense. It didn't work out for them, but they had the lead in multiple fourth quarters, like where I thought the, I thought the Pacers would win more games than they did in that series. It looked like they were going to. So I think, I don't know. The problem is, is that 
I don't think the Mavs can really push the pace because I don't think that um, this team is set up to be like sprinters right now. They're like, we, we got we to gotta let Luca play at his own pace because he's not 100% healthy. The man can barely get up and down the court half the time. So you're, you're going to have to rely on your defense more, but your defense is stronger than the Pacers were. So if you can pick your moments to pick, pick up the pace and then take advantage of your stronger defense, then you can basically play like a combination of like, we're just going to outscore you, but also like we're going to play a little defense here and there. (laughs) Of the speaking of the fast break, um, the Mavs in game one, I believe they had six fast break points on, uh, I believe it was, either two of six or three for nine shooting. I know it was 33.3%. And then in game two, only seven points on three of six on the fast break. Um, so they, they one, they don't score as many points as they have been um, on the break, but they've also not had as many opportunities um, in transition and in the fast break. And speaking back to the um, Boston three-point thing, um, this was this was so cherry-picked, but... <laughs> um, um, I'd said all season long when discussing three point rate that if you have a 50% three point rate, which Boston has about a 47, 48% rate, um, if you shoot 60% from two and 40% from three, you're basically getting, you're generating the same amount of points from both sides. Um, and if you hold Boston to below 37 and a half percent from three and their three point rate is somehow below 45% in the regular season and the playoffs, they are six and eight. And then if the rate is somewhere between 40 and 45%, while the uh, three point percentage is still below thirty seven and a half percent, Boston is two and six, and so like th- th- it didn't happen very much, but when it happened, it was more successful for the opponent than it was for Boston, and I I just don't know how mathematically that makes sense, but it does, um, and I guess that's probably the best way for the Mavs to kind of go forward is that you know if you let Boston shoot sixty threes, eventually they're going to take out your you're going they're going to just overtake you in scoring. Um, but you know, if they're selective with their threes and they're somewhat average, you at least give yourself a shot to kind of let, let your offense win the game for you, especially if you can keep yeah. it close at the end. Uh, does that, does that feel about accurate to you? Yeah. I mean, I would say, uh, the Mavs were lucky that they didn't, that Boston didn't make more of the wide open threes that they had the opportunity to in game two because there was several of those where it was like wow that was lucky guys you count your (laughs) blessings so i mean i think they need to stay strong on contesting the threes for sure because obviously we know that the celtics have the ability to make them so yeah i would yeah i would agree all right two things before we go first um what is your finals prediction and don't feel bad if you pick the Celtics because I, I I picked them as well um wh- who do you have winning this series and in, in how many games I think it's I'm gonna go with what I said before the series started even though I don't necessarily 100% believe this but I'm keeping my fingers crossed I think it's Celtics in six yeah yeah I'm right there with you so you know I mean we would like the Mavs to win to like have like we, um just for hometown bias or at least work bias but uh, yes. also uh, it, it would as a fan seeing seeing the northeast lose is, is kind of it's awesome <laughs> but um yeah i do i do have the celtics in six um so we'll see how that all plays out game three will be wednesday in dallas game four friday in dallas and then you know if it goes past that um, I explained the schedule in a previous episode It'd be Monday, Thursday, and then the following Sunday for games five, six, and seven. Uh, what I ask for all of my guests, the last thing that I ask them before we, before we depart is those of us in television have a specific vision for how we kind of want to go about the business and how we want to see it evolve as we get older and more experienced. And so for those of us in television, I would like you to tell your vision as a woman in, in sports broadcasting, which is a male dominated field. Um, how would you like to see sports broadcasting evolve as we get further into the future? Um, okay. I just would like to see more women in the 
tr- like women in the truck because I would say at least 90% of the time I'm the only female in the truck not necessarily on the crew because like usually our stage managers are female but like I never you I rarely see female directors I rarely see female producers um I don't even remember the last time like I saw I've had a couple females be audio people a couple females be TDs um typically we have female there's will be like more female graphic operators uh I did have we had one show that was a female camera person and I was like wow wild haven't seen that in a long time um so just like more women in the truck um I think it's a really hard industry to um be a woman and also like have aspirations of like family life I think it's really, really hard, um, which is why there's a lot of women who like will be in a position and then decide to leave because they want to have a family, which like utmost, uh, utmost respect to like totally get that. Um, but I just like more women in like leadership roles just because I think it's good for the industry just to have like a different perspective other than like being like the good old boys club, you know? Not that I've been treated poorly. I've been treated great, but just, it would be nice sometimes to like have someone I can relate to a little bit more. Yeah. I feel that. Oh man. Uh, Michaela, this was, this was absolutely fun. It's great to hear your perspective. It's great to have you on as a guest. And, um, it, it's always a pleasure getting to have any kind of a conversation with you, whether it's sports or anything else. Um, so I'm, I'm extremely thankful and one grateful for your place in my career and thankful that you came on to the show to you know, talk hoops and talk TV. So thanks. Hey, thanks very much. Happy for to be on. here. Thanks for having me.